Hello and uh, morning uh, to you all. Uh, this is Ravi Gupta. I am the CEO and founder of Elite Techno Media Private Limited, and uh, we have been bringing out a, ma a magazine called E Health for last 16 years. This is uh, perhaps India's first and the only magazine on E Health uh, being uh, published uninterrupted for 16 years, and uh, we have been running a portal on E Health and also. Uh, organizing several conferences on this. Uh, today, we are uh, out to have a esteemed uh, panel with us. Uh, I have uh, uh, in this panel some esteemed speakers. We have uh, Dr. Shushin Bajaj, uh, Dr. Neeraj Lal, Dr. Alok Malik, Samir Mehta, and Vinu Hello. Joseph. And uh, to start with, I am like going to request each of the speakers to uh, briefly introduce about, uh, themselves and their organizations so that we are setting the context for uh, the challenges and opportunities emerging out of the COVID-19. Yeah, uh, I, I think we lost Ravi. Uh, Vinu, let's start with you. We'll go clockwise as per the uh, or what comes on the screen. So, uh, should I? I'll share my uh, screen right now. Hello. Yes, Vinu. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, this is quite a very unique situation. My name is Vinu Joseph. I hope I am audible. Yes. Yeah. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we can. So uh, I work as the regional sales manager for Johnson & Johnson's ASP systems. And uh, today, we're going to talk about COVID-19 as a crisis, which has uh, created an opportunity. But I also would like to say that uh, this is one of the largest global crises that we are facing or humankind is facing. And uh, maybe of our generation, it's one of the biggest. And all the decisions that the government and the people take today and maybe in the next few weeks may change the course of not only um, the healthcare system, but also politically and economically and also uh, culturally. But uh, to set the tone stating, let us please understand that this storm will definitely pass. And of course, uh, but whatever decisions we make today will always be there lifelong. And I hope it may not be as bad as what it seems to be. So that is why I wanted to uh, share the, uh, I'll just put it as the screen. The next slide, uh, wherein we talk about what the COVID-19 pandemic at the moment is. So I have taken the liberty of uh, quoting from three main speakers. One is Yuval Noah Harari, the uh, author for um, the book Homo Sapiens and, and uh, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. And I've also taken from Siddharth Mukherjee what the way forward is. And also the most popular uh, writer, Chetan Bhagat, when I looked at his article. But one thing which strikes everybody is the uncertainty of this virus, the COVID-19, how it behaves, the novelty of it, how it works. And also one more problem that, or one of the most startling factors, the universality of the sickness around means it cut across all boundaries, it cut across all people, whether it's a rich person or a poor person, or a VIP or a non-VIP or a doctor or a nurse or a healthcare person, everyone is affected by the universality of this problem. And to make uh, the things so more complicated, you have very good data connectivity, internet, access to knowledge, access to information. So what happens is that this COVID-19 pandemic has now come to a very epic proportions in the minds of all the people around the world. And to quote what you will know, Harari is saying, if you look at what is happening today, whether it's in India, in US, in Spain or Italy, billions of people are obeying and complying with what the government is saying. So the big word that is happening for the cooperation and compliance of the people is the word trust. 
and that is a big change in the mindset of people and if you want to have people trust you they need to trust what you're telling them the media the authorities as well as science so that is a huge mindset that has changed right now if you look at the last um, two months or three months that is happening in the world siddharth mukherji has come up with a very innovative idea he was talking about uh, that we are counting about the viral spread across people so siddharth mukherji as you know is a very famous person who was got the booker prize for his book the emperor of all maladies now he says that we need to count it within the people and why he is saying so and why it is important to my talk is because right now if you look at the viral count on the people that will determine how we are going to actually work on the clinical course of covid 19 and why it is so important is because today as i am speaking today uh the world over especially in india and many of the countries we are facing a huge shortage of ppe personal protective equipments like you are looking about the n95 masks gloves and all these and now it has become such an extent that companies like us are now forced especially i'm going to be referring to sterilization like us are now forced to talk about or think about reprocessing or re-sterilizing these ppe and this becomes all the more important when we look at the last point by sadar pukherji and my company that is asp works on a plasma sterilization system in the cssd now this department in the cssd in all the hospitals as many people know would be either in the basement or maybe a small room which would be having an autoclave which would be having an eto machine which would be having a cleaning system and i've just shown a small diagram of exactly how this actually affects us you collect all instruments in one area clean it sterilize it and give it to different places but something which people don't realize and i think today when i am speaking now many people are realizing is this is this d is able to touch majority of the patients because of the present crisis uh, wherein we are looking at a ppp shortage and we have also understood that if you deviate from these practices it can definitely lead to infection now the question is what can be done so that this department or when you talk about reprocessing and sterilization can help us so before i go there i would like to make three points very clear and why i want to make three points very clear is when we studied in medical school we all talked about sterilization and disinfection today we are not talking about sterilization today we are just talking about reprocess this is a change which has happened in the past one year and the last two to three months this has become very very important a change reprocessing is the word they using now and not sterilization if you look at the us fda uh, news uh, letters which are coming out in the last 3 4 days they are talking about the word reprocessing if you look about a covid 19 we are looking about a n95 mask they are talking about reprocess if you look at about pp they talk about reprocessing if we looking about a laryngoscope they talk about reprocessing also the definitions have changed earlier we used to talk about uh, uh, we used to talk about um, uh, sterilization as the killing of all microorganisms including spores but today we are not looking at spores as a problem today we are looking at prions as a problem today we are looking at the n covid on 19 as a problem and for all the panel and everybody who's watching this in a sterilization point of view this virus is the easiest to kill on an instrument or on a, on, on anything on a surface but unfortunately when it comes onto the body it becomes a more more dangerous and more lethal thing now what is the change that can be done and what can be innovated in a hospital to make this changes one we have to be able to integrate the hospital it system with the cases why is it ready and why is it necessary it is necessary because we need data today without data we are not able to move if you're looking at reprocessing a mask or reprocessing a ppe we should be able to know how many times it has been done and today we can only rely on what is spread through a news from the department but today if we have an access where in sitting at your office or sitting at a purchase department or sitting uh, at the administration level you just have to click a button and just to know okay which pp has been used how many times it's been utilized whether it is sterilized or not sterilized all that needs to be done with the data it's very easy to say this but it is very very difficult to implement because data is what drives the system without a data we will not be able to go ahead and i have also put a couple of points here uh, the second thing is whether it is sterilized or not can only be determined if you have a faster system 
and of course when you run a system you should be able to use the resources very carefully now power and water are precious and since they are precious and why i'm saying precious is because you don't have many people coming to bring in tankers and systems so we need to utilize them well so we need something to save it and replacement cost today we are not able to uh, bring in materials we are not able to bring in raw materials we are not able to bring in people because of the restrictions of the lockdown so we have to look on saving these money now as i earlier said how can this this is only a schematic diagram and that's just wanted to show you that how we want to do this is all the data that is happening in the cssd or any part of the department should be connected with the hospital network you can do it through any system and that plus an instrument tracker why an instrument tracker is important it is very important because as i said to know about the number of times that you're using something and why is it that important because if it's a damage it could possibly affect the health of a healthcare doctor or a nurse or a housekeeping staff and above all a patient and all these need to be collected and kept not only in the server but also on a cloud why because of a cloud because tomorrow we're looking into a system wherein we have patients who are very well aware very well informed and they may start asking questions and you will also have a very well uh, uh, knit together insurance system which will definitely look into these questions and all this can be done with this so this is also a very schematic system what i'm calling today if you look at it uh, the realm of the cssd is a standalone unit but we need to connect it to all the departments and when i say all the departments i am talking about the purchase the biomedical and administration with data and i'm again stressing the word trustful data because today that is the only thing which is driving the system because we know that since we did not have enough data and enough knowledge about what happened in china we are going through this but that is leave aside that part alone but today by with this kind of a data available in all different hospitals all these hospitals can cooperate and help each other and each other means i'm talking about not only hospitals but i'm talking about hospitals across the globe and this only can be done if we have this kind of a system and that is why the usfda in the last four days came up with four bulletins on reprocessing of the systems and all that is based on data and i'm sure uh, india also can do this and it's not that we have a dearth of connectivity we can actually work better on this actually and the new innovation that is needed in the cssd because i'm talking about innovations is first of all we are not talking about the rob not only the robustness of sterilization it's not whether you can kill a spore or not but the most important thing is whether the sterilization or whether the sterilizing agent or whether that machine is able to take care of the materials which are fragile and now that is becoming more and more important because when you're talking about a a, a very one time usage of a mask like an n95 mask which we earlier used to use and throw but in this emergency situation you're looking into putting it once again after reprocessing you need a system which can actually take care of fragile systems and of course an autoclave will not be able to do that or a steam sterilizer will not be able to do that because the water presence or the steam presence and the high temperature will actually discharge the charges in the system and each your machine will not be able to do that and each your machine will not be able to do that because it needs a huge time for aeration at least 12 hours so that is also a challenge you can't dip it in any chemical sterilizer like a glutaraldehyde Or, or, or an orthothelialdehyde or systems because that will actually affect the working of the filters so now it's not only the robustness of the sterilization that is needed it is also whether the machine is able to take care of fragile environment fragile materials also the most important thing that now people are talking is whether if you sterilize it on it is it safe on the healthcare worker can he use it can he be put on the patient so this is the change that is happening and also now another change that people are now talking if you look at the papers and the media is about what is happening in the environment so whatever you are using in the hospital should be safe for the environment now the biggest challenge that a hospital is facing today with covid 19 is how fast you can get your mask or your pp your instruments or devices as fast as possible to the patient or to the healthcare worker so fast is one most important thing i'm looking at the speed less than 30 minutes to reprocess also for the benefit of the doctors many of them will say is the the the, the materials that i'm using or the, the reprocessed material that i'm using is it actually validated is there a biological yeah. indicator that can give me today we have a system wherein 
uh, after only 24 hours, you're able to validate a load. But is that the correct method? Of course, that may not be the correct method, but that is what is happening. So we have to look at an innovation wherein you'll be able to release the load of the mask or the PP or, or the instruments or the devices to the patient and to the doctor or to the operating nurse or to the person in the ICU within 30 minutes before you release the load. And most importantly, it should be cost effective and sustainable. Now, for all this to happen, there are different, different things that can be done. So today we have different, different methodology. The CDC in 2019, in 2019, the CDC came up with a, uh, with a document, which was actually an updated document of the 2008 uh, guidelines on disinfection and instrument reprocessing, wherein they mentioned about a particular technology known as low temperature hydrogen peroxide gas plasma technology. And that is in addition to three other low temperature technologies that they have mentioned and validated. The first was ETO, which they say that it has to be phased because of issues. The second was parasitic acid, but unfortunately you can't pack it and you can't use it. And the third was this low temperature peroxide plasma system. Now I'm just quoting from that and I've just put these four bullet points for the benefit of everybody watching, or watching. And that is by using these kind of a system wherein the US FDA today in April 12, that was yesterday night, released a document stating that plasma sterilizers need to be used for reprocessing of N95 masks and combine that data with what has been put in in the 2019 updated version of CDC. You are looking at a technology which can take care of all instruments and all masks and all systems in a very cost effective manner. And these are the four points that I've put here. It's, you can read it. So that's why I'm not going to explain that. The repair cost and all. And that is the new innovation. So a plasma, uh, a plasma system with data connectivity, with a validation of 30 minutes before the release of the load can actually help us to tide over this crisis. I'm not saying completely, but at least 10 to 20 percent. And this is what is happening today. And many hospitals all over the world, and I'm also, I've just read now, that in Sri Chitra Trinal, that is an SCT, they have actually found out a, uh, a super absorbent material that can be used to uh, throw away the secretions or the, the, the droplets that are coming out of a COVID-19 patient. So that is also one more innovation. So with these kind of uh, system, wherein you have a plasma system with the data connectivity that can be connected to the hospital network and also validation that can be done in half an hour, I think we are looking into actually conquering this problem. Of course, this is only an emergency use about using these, but if this is not a foolproof system, but I think this is something that we needs to be taken up in the future. This I would like to say, thank you very much. Thanks, Vinu. That was a pretty long introduction. Um, so we, uh, uh, since we are moving clockwise, uh, the next person is me. I am uh, Alok, I have been running hospitals for the last 20 years and currently a group CEO of a uh, round about 1,000 bed hospital chain in South India. Um, uh, for this particular panel discussion, we are having three sets of questions. The first one is uh, around the strategy, pre-COVID and post-COVID strategy. The strategy basically means business continuity and business growth. Second one is operational plan. What are the things specifically that we might be doing? And uh, uh, of course, the third one is uh, part of that was covered by Vinu. Um, is uh, what, uh, uh, what are we doing to overcome infrastructural gaps within our hospital, right? Now, uh, so uh, can we now uh, kind of rotate and have a rapid round of introduction? Dr. Neeraj, uh, Samir, Dr. Suchin, and uh, of course, Dr. Ravi is there. Uh, hi, I'm Neeraj Lal. I'm Vice President and Cluster Head for Rainbow Children Hospital based out of Bangalore. Uh, uh, and we have a group of hospitals which is based out of Hyderabad, Chennai, Delhi, Bangalore. So we run a mother and child hospital chain in the country. 
uh, and uh, and regarding the hospital health innovation what we do see i'll, I'll give you example our still 30 to 40 percent business is still on because we have a birthright segment which is taking care of mother maternity part of it see what we are doing we have an antenatal classes so antenatal classes we used to call all these expected mother to the hospital so our our dr rekha sodarshan used to take their take their classes so what we have done few days back we have all we have called all these mother on a zoom platform and our physiotherapists our new neurologists our option gynecologists is teaching them antenatal session on zoom platform and i have seen the maximum occupancy on zoom call was 110 so it is a very good feel okay, in spite of this COVID thing where people are not coming out. We are using this platform to teach the antenatal session to them. We also thought of there's so many people who used to refer patients, this new nurse from different part of Bangalore, Karnataka and outside. So we have done one call with them, uh, with our doctors. So they are talking to them, you know, in, in these kind of situation, how to take care of your patient, when to refer and how to refer and all those things. Because they just cannot move out to their clinic and the hospital. So we are doing all those things here. And uh, uh, like what we do, uh, we have created a hospital here. Where most of the hospital have created a, a, a room, isolation room, where these patients come. We used to screen them. And only after screening, as per our SOP, we used to screen them to the various wards as well as the ICU. So these are the few things which we are attempting to do in this, in our hospital for this COVID times. Thanks, Neeraj. Um... Hi, this is Samir Mehta. I'm the vice chairman of Dr. Mehta's hospitals. We're an 87 year old health system now. We have two hospitals. One is COVID dedicated uh, and the other one is everything but COVID as we joke about it. Uh, both our hospitals, there are about 500 beds, both located in Madras, Chennai. And uh, uh, primary focus is obviously surgical maternity, where we've, uh, in our main hospital, had crossed a million births a couple of years back and strong in pediatrics. Uh, to kind of like give a flavor of uh, some of the uh, innovations or things that we have seen is clearly now we're working quite strongly with the government and the state representatives, both center and state. Uh, to look at uh, how to survive the storm in many ways because I think most states kind of like arrived into this a little bit uh, later and have been basically acting as catch-up. So how does the private sector, which represents most of the ventilator beds, most of the critical care beds, play a role in helping stabilize uh, a crisis that clearly needs those two pieces of the uh, ecosystem? The second piece is around new technology, we invest in about uh, 10 companies per year. And some of our companies, for example, One Health Sensei, which does uh, a lot of remote monitoring of customers, both within hospitals as well as beyond hospitals, that seems to have all of a sudden caught flavor of times because uh, we don't have to see a customer, we don't have to walk and visit a, a, a customer or a patient in an ICU as often as we typically do uh, with some of these remote monitoring vital measurement devices. Uh, I think that's also been quite interesting. And the third is really how do we help at a state and central level by sharing best practices. Uh, so simple things like uh, how often can you recycle PPEs, uh, where can you buy lower cost PPEs and uh, how do you survive a time like this? Because most hospitals like us, which serve the community, are struggling. Uh, IP is down. OP has been a challenge because we're not allowed to do, uh, obviously, elective work. Uh, and clearly, when people can't move around, when they're worried about a hospital environment, how do you as a healthcare influencer system, how do you play a role in perhaps keeping your customers safe? Uh, especially the long term as well as new customers. Thank you. Thank you. I think Ravi is there, so I, uh, I think he has better bandwidth, so he can take over now. <laughs> Hello. Thank you, Dr. Alok. Uh, I hope uh, all have uh, given their introductions, or Dr. Shushin, have you introduced yourself? 
Yeah, so uh, uh, I was waiting to be called upon, so uh, those, uh, warm greetings to everybody. Good afternoon to all of you in our part of the world. Uh, I am Dr. Shuchin Bajaj. I am the founder director of Ujala Cygnus Group of Hospitals. Uh, we run uh, 12 hospitals in four states of North India, uh, catering to the most underserved of communities. Our focus is mainly at the bottom of the pyramid, where uh, good quality facilities are not available. So we are in towns where usually earlier you had to travel four to five hours to go to the big city to access good quality accredited healthcare. Uh, our hospitals mainly focus on emergencies where the golden hour is of importance like cardiology, neurosurgery, intensive care. So we have all NABH accredited hospitals, typically about 100, 150 beds each in these small towns. And uh, uh, since everybody has been speaking of uh, innovations on what uh, we have all been trying to do, I, I truly hear everybody, it's, it's been a tough time for the entire world, let alone our community. And uh, I think uh, Lenin's words are uh, uh, really worth speaking right now. He said that uh, nothing happens for decades and then decades can happen in weeks. So, uh, healthcare is going through a similar challenge. Uh, uh, we've been talking of disruption and how to change healthcare for a very long time now. Uh, but uh, I think this is something of the scale of what Airbnb did to hotel industry. They were also very comfortable saying that hotels have been doing this for thousands of years, getting your bed to sleep, getting you food and keeping you secure in the night. This is what hotels do. They've been doing this for 2,000 years. We'll be doing this again for 2,000 years. And suddenly Airbnb came and changed everything very, very quickly. So I think healthcare is at that uh, cusp right now. We can either slip and go to complete depths or we can rise to the occasion and, uh, and build something. So we've already been pushed off the cliff, I feel. It is up to us to either build the parachute or... or go down very quickly. So we've been also trying a lot of things because we work in small towns. So our, our focus has always been on uh, very, very affordable healthcare. So uh, we've announced a complete uh, uh, free of cost teleconsultation platform. Uh, very recently, we are doing almost 600 to 700 calls every day because we feel our, uh, we are building that ecosystem into uh, the, the community uh, psyche right now so uh, we, we, uh, we've we been thinking of doing it for a long time but when push came to shove and we realized that OPDs had fallen to zero we did it in three days flat in three days the system was up running and, and we were uh, attending to calls uh, running into hundreds every day so I think some things really push you uh, we've already heard about how PPEs are being sourced and used so we are also a part of a very big initiative to get PPE to hospitals. Uh, we've already worked with the State Bank of India to get about two crores worth of PPEs into medical colleges in the states that we work in because they want to work only with public healthcare providers. We are working with organizations like United Way, which uh, uh, donates PPEs, so they've given us as well some PPEs. Uh, we are training our staff on a daily basis. We are really standing by them. It is a difficult time for them as well because it is they are really putting everything on the line, their health, their family's health. And it is a tough time for everybody. But uh, I hope uh, we'll come out of this uh, stronger. I hope we'll come out of this uh, on a much better platform than we were. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. I think the quote from Lenin was uh, highly appropriate. Uh, so, uh, uh, Let's uh, talk about briefly, how has this COVID crisis shaken up the healthcare ecosystem in the country itself? Uh, let's not uh, talk about abroad. So talk about India and talk specifically about the context in which you are operating, in your city, in your state or in your hospital itself. And how are you dealing with it? I think some of it, uh, Dr. Shuchin has already elaborated, but uh, I will request other uh, speakers to us also elaborate about it. So, um, Neeraj Lalji, um, how uh, COVID-19 has shaken up the healthcare ecosystem in your hospital and uh, in your city? 
Uh, see, uh, since we are a mother and child hospital, our business is reduced to half. We were generally seeing 400 patients per day. Now, because of this video consultation, we are just seeing around 70 to 80 patients per day. Our vaccination has dropped. There's a panic call which we are getting from the parents and all. Our our uh, our birthright segment, that is the maternity segment, is working well because you cannot hold the deliveries and all. It is happening, but uh, but I have seen most of the most of the people have gone their homes. They don't want to come back to Bangalore. So all those things are happening. But since uh, since uh, you know, for the last one week, I have seen a video consultation has gone up. We have created one platform on Microsoft Teams where where every doctor is doing a 12, 10 to 12 video consultation per day and we are sending the prescription on their mail. We have started a pharmacy also. A primary vaccination has all, already been started, but our planned surgery like pediatric orthopedic and pediatric surgery has been put on hold for quite some time. Uh, so these are the challenges which we are facing there. But one thing which we have done in Bangalore, so what we have done, we are a group of seven, eight private hospital which we have here. So we are sharing the info because PPE is a big, big time hit in across all the country and all the hospitals. So we are sharing the prices of these things because I'll give you example of by marks. Some people are talking 12 rupees, some people are talking 14 rupees. We have we have formed a group, small group, where all the CEOs of hospitals share the prices. And you can see them from 14 rupees, we are just getting three ply pass of rupees five. So these kind of information we are sharing so that we are, because we all are on the same pages. And in order to connect, because our, most of the babies come from outside Bangalore, like new, new nits and all, 600 grams, 800 grams and all. So these obstetrician and pediatrician are in the panic call. So we have tied up with the, all the local police station. The special approval has been given. So there are our new net ambulance move from one part of the city to a different part of the city. So these kind of thing happen, except our perinatal business. Uh, uh, all, all business has gone down, but perinatal business is happening well. So Excellent. that's all from Bangalore. Thanks, uh, Neeraj. Uh, Dr. Alok, uh, can you uh, elaborate the situation? Uh, yeah, um, uh, in most of our hospitals, uh, business down around 50%. And uh, what continues is emergency business. Uh, so the cath labs are working, ICUs are working, theaters are working. Um, OPDs are virtually shut, but then OPDs are restarting through video consultation. Uh, uh, one thing, I, 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 if I can put some parallels to to what happened during the swine flu in India. If those of us who have seen swine flu, I was very much in the thick of it. It was uh, right here in Pune. It was worse in Pune. The only difference between, I guess, swine flu and COVID is that COVID became a pandemic spread rapidly across the world. Swine flu didn't. But even today, uh, the mortality rate in Pune of COVID and swine flu is virtually the same. Right? And there was a scare, right? At that time, there was no government-mandated lockdown, but people were scared, so they went into lockdown for nearly uh, six weeks during swine flu. And then people started coming back, and I guess by the time 40-50% herd immunity was there, the flu just disappeared. And it just keeps coming back uh, as a seasonal flu now. Of course, a vaccine came the next year. All the people who were uh, kind of... Uh, who were, uh, 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 at risk, they took the vaccine first, and uh, now nobody bothers about swine flu. Next year, nobody will bother about COVID. That's my prediction. Um, of course, uh, hospitals need to uh, need to know what they need to do now and what they need to do in the future. And many of those decisions are going to be financial, right? Many of those decisions are going to be financial, and uh, this is the time when. Uh, uh, you would like to, for example, sit on catch, right? Uh, the things that uh, we need to do is uh, uh, create a team A and B uh, in within your uh, situation. Team A studies uh, what is a tactical response? How do you do your? Uh, how do you access PPs? How do you re-sterilize PPs? How do you keep your staff safer? especially staff in ER, staff in ICU, staff in OT, staff in uh, ICU and, uh, and staff in the cath lab. How do you keep them safer? How do you, I mean, we have been improvising PPE. When PPE is not available, you can improvise PPE. You know how the, how that stupid virus comes into you. You can improvise stuff. I mean, 
there are so many videos of um, of face shields being made out of OHP paper, which is so cheap. And uh, so the full face shield uh, is available now in Hyderabad for 40 rupees a piece. So lots of things are being made locally. That's the uh, only difference between US and India, I guess. In India, lots of PPEs are being made locally. We are not dependent on buying it from somewhere else. Um, uh, so that's the May what it does. Team B looks at what to do three months from now, six months from now, one year from now. But team B is the finance driven. And what team B does is you figure out how to conserve cash at all costs. You will need it for unfo unforeseen circumstances. You may need it for another lockdown. May God forbid. Okay. You may need to take care of the, your good staff to retain them, right? Um, if there is no other lockdown, if there is no other pandemic, max to max nine months later, we will be in full recovery. Till then, we have to cut costs, reduce salaries, prune manpower if needed. Um, don't increase your debt load. Increase your equity in the company. It's better to be overcapitalized than to be over leveraged. Being over leveraged in such situations where cash flow is at risk will be a disaster. Avoid the debt trap. Give discounts. Let investors make money, but get more capital instead of getting more debt. And when coming to debt, it's so important to build relationship and trust with the bank. Don't move relationship was for a quarter of a half a percent. This is the time to have good relationships running with the banks. Okay. So, uh, so th th those are my thoughts of what we need to do now, what we need to do later within our own hospital. We have teams uh, who are uh, expert teams who are looking after how to sanitize a patient's uh, because we are now treating every patient as a COVID patient. Incidentally, COVID patients are masquerading at every other disease. They're coming as MI, they're coming as, uh, uh, as uh, strokes, they're coming in as uh, uh, renal failure, and they turn out to be COVID. They're coming in as pain abdomen, in surgical ICU, getting operated, and then turn out to be COVID. So uh, we're treating every patient who comes in an emergency because we are just treating emergencies now. Um, uh, every patient is treated to be as if he is COVID positive. So we take universal precaution. We either have PPs or we improvise. We have at least the improvised PP. All, if you see, every nurse has uh, this full, uh, uh, who are working in ER, every staff working in ER or working in uh, the OT or working in ICU or the cath lab, they have the full surgical gown, OT gowns. They are, they are taken back from them. They are soaked in bleach and washed the same night and then given to them the next day. So, uh, so they don't take them home. They don't take any of the uniforms home for washing, which is what used to happen in the non-COVID times, right? And uh, similarly, there are teams which are looking out for PP manufacturers, looking out for best rates, looking out for buying. Uh, and there are teams looking out for how to recycle them. So the, the individual uh, areas of uh, excellence, uh, tactically and uh, strategically, uh, we are managing, we have a business continued meeting every week where we, uh, where we uh, review the cash flow, review incoming cash, review possible outgoing cash. We have, uh, Everybody has voluntarily taken a pay cut. Of course, the lower paid employees have, uh, have uh, been spared. Some Everybody below 30K. Uh, anyway, everybody beyond that uh, slab wise has taken a pay deduction, which will be refunded to them once the cash flow comes back to normal. Um, this includes doctors as well. Uh, all vendors prior to March, we are stopping payment, we are, but we are doing month to month payments. March payments are being made in April, but February payments are pending and they all know why this is happening. So you conserve cash flow. This is the time to sit on cash. You don't know what's going to happen next. If uh, you don't want to be going borrowing money to run your business right now. Great input, Salok. Uh, thanks. Uh,
maybe uh, request uh, Binu Joseph to respond how uh, you think that uh, COVID-19 has shaken up the healthcare ecosystem, healthcare business. Your inputs. Binu? Yeah. Um, uh, Joel? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Ravi. Uh, see? Perspective, yeah. Yeah, so uh, what has happened right now, as everybody, every of the panel, the doctors have said, uh, it has actually affected the patient flow. It has affected business everywhere. Of course, our industry also has been affected very badly uh, by this also. And um, now the most difficult part is we are not able to get materials to many hospitals because of the lockdown. Uh, their houses have been forced to shut down in Bangalore, Chennai, in Bombay. So that is a major uh, constraint for us also. and. Uh, what we believe right now is uh, to whichever resources the hospitals are having right now to manage it internally. So uh, for a company perspective and what is happening in healthcare that we are seeing nowadays uh, is that there has been a big shortage of material right now. And there is also a big uh, shortage of not only material, manpower, and also we need to work on it strongly. Thank you. Thank you, Vinu. Uh, may I have a perspective from Samir Mehta? Samir. Yeah, so um, I think most of the ideas that have been already covered quite well, you have to cut costs, you have to protect cash, uh, avoid debt like the plague. Uh, so a couple of other things that I think have worked well. One is this is the time to embrace new technology because from a clinician as well as a practitioner point of view, including consumers, uh, everyone is willing to try new things. Uh, who would have imagined that we sit on five Zoom calls a day? Reality is even my kids are doing Zoom calls to study. Uh, even my parents are doing Zoom calls. So I think consumer behavior is changing at a scale because there is no other choice, right? Necessity has become the mother of invention. So uh, human behavior has changed fundamentally. The second thing is around partnerships. I think Neeraj said it really well. Uh, how a number of private hospitals. So we're working with about some 40 private hospitals uh, across the country to get PPEs at a pretty low cost to each of us. And one of the things we've realized is that by sharing some of these best practices and fundamentals, uh, we're able to figure out how many times some of these PPEs can be recycled safely because we don't have empirical data that can show it at the moment, right? You're getting a PP from, let's say, supplier A, and you don't know really what the quality is. They can have a chappa on it, but that doesn't really mean that much uh, in today's world. So I think those are examples where we've learned to work. The third area we've probably worked a lot more is with the government. Uh, this is one where we have to say hats off because this was never going to be an easy task. Both the central and the state governments in various states at least I can talk about my state uh, and uh, hearing experience from Kerala and Karnataka. Hats off, they've really uh, gone above and beyond to try and work with the private sector in a uh, mostly, I would argue, a sensible manner of how do they keep costs low from a customer access point of view. Uh, it sometimes hurts us as a private provider because we don't see as many patients. But the reality is the government's role is not to give private hospital full. Yeah, the government's role is uh, not to give private hospitals full beds, but really to minimize the amount of cost and pain from a customer's point of view uh, who are voting them into power. And I think if I look at our state, uh, seems to be a reasonably good job. Uh, clearly, I think the amount of testing that's taking place, we need to find a rapid, uh, quick test on the cold face, because that seems to be, if you don't know if a person's a carrier, and they're walking into a hospital, let's say like Neeraj's or ours, that's looking after maternity, then uh, how do you guarantee the safety of a pregnant mother or a child, a neonate that's in those hospitals? How do you guarantee the safety of somebody who is uh, 75 and coming in for some other emergency into my hospital? At the moment, I have no real way of being able to moderate and qualify that. So that is an area that we desperately need to figure out how to have a better solution than we have today. Uh, I think the other real benefit is this would be a great time to share more best practices about 
uh, which are good telemedicine platforms. And I know Kaho as an organization has done some good work on it recently. Uh, but things like that, how can you enable hospitals to go further than what they're doing today? Uh, but I think this is all coming down to two fundamental things. How do you keep your customers safe? And how do you keep your uh, staff and institutes safe, right? You can't do that if you can't cut costs because today we're not making enough money uh, to be able to even make payroll. So from that point of view, when we're doing, uh, I guess, hammer to post, a family office like ours can keep putting money into the system, but that's not really feasible uh, in the long term. And that's not feasible for many of the smaller hospitals out there. So we need to find slightly better ways uh, than where we are today. Uh, any sort of moratorium to support hospitals, whether it's around debt, whether it's around electricity bills uh, and rates would be deeply appreciated from industry. Uh, excellent input, uh, Sameer. Uh, I, I think uh, many in the general uh, public think uh, that uh, hospitals are uh, the richest uh, people right now in this situation, but uh, they I don't uh, know the other side of the story at all. So I think uh, this uh, message has to go out uh, to the policy makers in a bigger way that hospitals have problems right now. Uh, Dr. Suchin Bajaj, your perspective, how has this situation shaken up this sector? Yeah, so uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Alok Malik and Dr. Sam Mehta have raised very important points. Uh, I also agree with them that conserving cash flows right now and cutting costs is of great importance. Second, how do you ensure that all your patients and all your doctors and staff are safe uh, from the epidemic? Uh, so I feel right now we are fighting a 21st century war with 20th century weapons. Our weapons are truly outdated and we have to think of newer ways, newer technologies. And as Dr. Sam Mehta also said, this is the right time to embrace the new technologies. Uh, somebody was talking to me about a, a very uh, funny message that he got that, uh, you know, who has driven the digital transformation in your company the most? Was it your CEO or was it your CTO? Was it your CMO? So he said, none of the above. The digital transformation has been driven by COVID. So everything, every company is, uh, you know, embracing digital like anything. Like Sam said, our children's schools have gone all completely digital. They have their online classes. Our hospitals, OPDs have gone completely digital. We are either calling them on phone or uh, or video calls on WhatsApp now. So we don't, uh, we are not using very high-end platforms, but it's working out very well for the patients who could not travel to the OPDs. Uh, so I think this... Uh, virus has changed something permanently, like HIV changed surgical practices permanently forever. So you had to screen everybody for HIV before allowing them into your operation theater. Like 9-11 changed airline travel completely forever. You can't dream of running into the airport and getting into an airplane now. So I think this is how COVID will change surgical and medicinal practices forever and for the good, I think. It will increase patient safety, it will increase staff safety, it will ensure that hospitals stick to protocols much more than what they've been doing now. Uh, so uh, I think uh, we, uh, till the time we don't have a herd immunity or vaccine in place, it will be a good idea to advocate to the government that we should screen everybody irrespective of uh, what disease they are suffering from. Like Dr. Alok Malik said, they are masquerading as anything. MIs, pain abdomens, diarrheas. It's not just pneumonias that COVID patients are coming with. They are coming into operation theaters, getting operated, and three days later we realize that you know they were suffering from COVID and the post-operative mortality is as high as 20% in these asymptomatic COVID patients that you electively operate. So I think the way to go is advocacy. The way to go is talk to the government. As, uh, as uh, 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 Dr. Sam Mehta said, collaboration, we need to work with each other to find the best quality, cheapest PPE kits. We need to find out the best practices on how to recycle them, how to use them the most efficiently. So everything has shaken up. I think the entire industry is for a big overhaul. 
we are looking at more of home health care this behavioral change that the patients are now experiencing this comfort of calling and talking to doctors from their home without having to travel to the hospital wait in lines find parking or find a car to go this behavioral change will be difficult to turn back so every hospital every healthcare provider has to be ready to provide online concerts healthcare at home for non emergency things so i think the hospitals will now just be stuck with doing emergency work right like they are doing now for a long time to go all the electives and all the uh, outpatient concerts will move to online platforms uh, if this lockdown continues for more than a month or two months excellent inputs uh, should be uh, we have like discussed about the various challenges and uh, we have also uh, discussed that this is going to shake up the whole system the healthcare ecosystem and uh, as dr shushil said that uh, uh, many things which we were doing will fundamentally change now so uh, can each of the uh, panelists identify which are the areas which will which are emerging as the changes and the uh new opportunities of solutions emerging and how will health care uh, ecosystem make itself more agile to handle uh, this situation through innovations neeraj ji if you have any uh, inputs you can start with that see i'll give you example i think patient engagement is very important part whether you are talking to the patient on a vc or you are you are you are you are asking them on phone and all i'll give you example apart from patient one of the biggest thing is corporates corporate also engage with the private hospital in a big way so what we have done we have created a schedule for all these banks because all these banks are working like we have created a schedule for axis bank and hdfc bank because they are all in panic situation they are all in stress the so many so many mails and whatsapps forward is coming they are in a confused state of mind so what we have done our doctors are talking to them on a different banks or different branch in and around bangalore we talk to them about what are the problem they are facing what are the questions they are asking because there are so many questions and there are no answer you know people are talking so we have created a weekly schedule where our doctors are talking to these people because most of the corporate is working from home but certain essential corporates like banks and all they are working and there's a like most of the school is now uh, now now working from home like most of the students are talking on zoom or skype call and all those things so we are also talking to the teacher since we are a mother and child hospital so our pediatrician are talking to the teacher how to you know apart from school and education how they take care of themselves in the term of health and hygiene because that is very important part of it so we are engaging with our patients with our doctors and with our corporate in a unique way and that way is e way now most of the corporate i'll i'll give, give you example uh, like what sam was talking earlier this private hospital was not talking to each other they are not sharing the rates of pp now because of the covid we used to share our supplies department is in touch with their supplies department and all uh, you know so all those things are very important and thankfully in the state of karnataka they have created a 14 covid referral hospital so every hospital is not supposed to take care of covid patient so we used to refer this patient to this mpanel 14 hospital which is taking covid referral patient so this is unique initiative otherwise every hospital cannot manage this pay pay pay, pay patient depending upon the rooms depending upon the facility and all so i want to stress on these points excellent inputs uh, dr alok uh, please respond on uh, what innovations like we are going to see now uh, to handle this situation see this situation uh, i i am pretty sure the situation will blow over next um, 6 to 9 months from now but then uh, what do we do for those 9 months as we said conserve cash um, uh, look after business continuity have continuously monitor business continuity and uh, the hospitals the units which are uh, going to succeed in doing that successfully um um will ultimately reap the benefit 9 months later because they are still alive they are still success they are still healthy now uh, what does it need to have business continuity the healthcare market in any case uh, had become 
pretty aggressive and pretty um uh, it was a bad mark to be in i mean you ask any pe investor for the last 2 3 years in any case so which were the hospitals which were managing to survive uh, with positive cash flow hospitals which were managing cost optimizing the cost well hospitals which were uh, aggressively tackling revenue leakages hospitals which were uh, working on low margin high volume business model the, uh, as i say the geo model right now hospitals on the other end of the spectrum working on high margin and okay whatever volume comes is fine but i'll do only high margin business uh they don't bother about their cost they don't bother about their revenue leakages i'm making enough money anyway so why bother about these small things they will find it difficult going you know people are saying that lots of small and middle hospitals are going to collapse and predicting lots of big hospitals will get into trouble because they have huge fixed costs they have uh, they have very poorly optimized costs uh, on the variable side also and uh, they have huge revenue leakages i have worked in many of them and i know how how leaky they are right at the same time uh, you must uh, uh, all we must also remember that uh, uh, the industry as such now who is going to be a patient nine months later no covid um, but the rest of the economy is still starting right most of these big ticket hospitals they are uh, depending on lots of uh, patients coming and giving them big uh, ticket uh, bills 4 lakh 5 lakhs 10 lakhs and they will get operated and go back but uh, once the economy itself is depressed uh, what will um, uh, where will these patients come from whereas uh, hospitals working on low margins high volume they will continue to have um, to, to 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 have business so this, this is something uh, that everybody needs to think the third thing which is going to happen and which is actually started happening i i've had two contacts with such gentlemen um is uh, um, the vulture funds have started becoming active know that hospitals are going to get into trouble the two such one already contact me ke boss you know lots of people lots of hospitals let's start working together come on board and uh, we will pick up hospitals which are stressed and what these guys do this is the established model in the us unfortunately it is uh, it is um, coming in india as well um they will um, stressed hospital which is worth 100 rupees today they will pick them up for 20 rupees they will drastically reduce cost by letting go of high paid employees they will put in some money so that the hospital remains functional and one year later they will sell it back at 100 rupees when the business environment improves they will do nothing to improve the hospital right so that will also start happening and that will happen to hospitals which have uh, not managed their cash flow not planned on their business continuity that's going to happen great uh, points uh, binu joseph uh, you are on the other side of the hospitals you are Uh, working with the healthcare equipment industry, and how are you seeing the situation both from the supply side and the demand side, and how will the situation change in next uh, nine months, six months? Thank you. Um, from a medical device system that we are operating on, I see that uh, of course, as I earlier said, the storm will pass. I mean, it definitely has to pass. but there are going to be so many drastic changes as the distinguished panel has said actually but what i am seeing in future is that uh, yes there would be challenges but i see that there is definitely not going to be a dearth in the number of patients whether it could be uh, in the uh, on the operating cost also and as a medical device manufacturer or as from the other side of the spectrum i see that people now will have more faith in the hospitals if you look at the newspapers the, the the ordinary man today is having trust on the hospitals so this is something which never used to happen earlier you just look at the newspapers everybody is either waiting for the bulletin from the minister from the state 
or a central minister to talk. So that is something which has never happened. So I am definitely very positive that, uh, that there is going to be a very huge trust among all the hospitals, whether it is going to be a private hospital or a public sector hospital. And what I see from a medical device manufacturing point is that yes, with all these challenges, I feel that uh, 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 it may, as all the panelists have said, the business may, be, may come in, but it will be slow. But the most important factor I see and, I, and the most optimistic thing I see is that the trust of the people are going to have with the healthcare system, which will actually reap a lot of dividends. Thank you. Uh, very interesting perspective uh, Venu has given that uh, trust in hospitals will increase and that's a good news actually. Yes, yeah, it is. Very relevant news. Uh, Dr. Sushin Bajaj, your uh, how will things pan out in six to nine months? Uh, what changes in the CBA ecosystem? Yeah, so. Uh, uh, I love the vulture capital fund analogy, Dr. Malik. It was quite uh, uh, wonderful <laughs> to, to say the least. We can talk a lot about it later as well. But uh, yeah, so uh, I feel that, you know, to protect ourselves from vultures, the most important thing is we don't die. So in addition to saving our patients, we have to save our hospitals as well. So the primary objective for everyone should be please don't die please don't let your business die do not let your hospitals shut down because of this so manage your cash flows cut costs as much as you can uh, as doctors running businesses we sometimes tend to be very sympathetic to a lot of issues that uh, a hardcore businessman would not usually be so we are loath to cut salaries of doctors, of employees. So it is. it takes a lot of effort from inside for us to even think of these things. We feel that our doctors are really precious resources and we cannot afford to lose them at any cost. But uh, if uh, worst comes to worst, I think these decisions will have to be discussed, will have to be made. And uh, the way you communicate these decisions, I think is the most important. So the leaders in the organizations have to really stand up now and keep talking to the employees, keep talking to all doctors, make sure that everybody gets on your side before you start communicating these things. So you don't want to fight them as well as the COVID. On, you can't afford to fight on both fronts. So you have to make sure that your doctors and your team is with you fighting against this problem rather than fighting with you on salaries and personal protective equipments and how the facilities are not good enough, which we've already started seeing happening in some of the hospitals. The clinicians have started speaking out against management because they feel the management is not keeping their interests on top of their mind. The PPE is not good enough. The quality is not good enough or the numbers are not good enough. So you need to make sure that uh, you take care of your people uh, first. You take care of your business uh, as well. And then in the future, as I said, you have to embrace digitalization to a massive degree. So uh, use platforms which we as doctors have not even heard of. So I was talking to my digital team and they were saying that TikTok is a brilliant platform to engage with uh, uh, the rural and semi-urban population. And I always felt TikTok was all about random stupid videos which either made you laugh or cringe. But then we did more research and we found out a gynecologist who has almost 5 lakh followers on TikTok and what she does is only 20 second videos on just common problems that people ask her in her OPD chamber. So she just collates those questions and answers them 20-30 seconds each and she has 5 lakh followers on TikTok and there's not, not even one stupid video there. It's all very very relevant gynecological information. So I think we need to see what are the various channels that we've all been missing forever. Second, we should start definitely working on two-way digitalization. If we can engage with our patients two-way rather than just one way, it will be a it will be a game changer absolutely. So, uh, and thirdly, we should just completely own the digital space now on healthcare. If any patient of ours wants to know anything about healthcare. We should try and own that space. They should come only to us. They should not go to any quacks or any unqualified people, which they usually do, and get all kinds of misinformation, which actually jumbles up their brain more than clearing it up. 
so this is the time for all organized healthcare chains who have the uh, the capabilities they already have their digital teams in place to just stand up go out and own the digital space completely which we've been lacking in doing so far we've just been working on the margins of the of the digital space and social media channels while it has been completely conquered by people who are not really knowledgeable and who peddle out all sorts of things so the future i think the next 6 to 8 months the middle level is survival of the fittest survival of the leanest and survival of people who actually embrace new technologies rather than just playing catch up okay uh, thank you dr suchin dr uh, savi mehta uh, you want to add something on your perspective on this issue Yeah, sorry. I I said most of the points are already well covered. I have a slightly contrarian view on the digital. See, I think behavior is not a simple thing to predict. Today we're in the middle of a crisis where a customer has very few uh, input sources or areas of getting expertise and energy, uh, and therefore digital looks rosy and great. Uh, the moment this virus goes, digital. will still play a big role bigger than it did before but it will not be the be all and end all of a uh, solution space i still think a clinician their method of communication in front of a consumer whether it's a nurse an allied health worker or the doctor is still king and yes we will take more steps around digital but it won't solve uh, i think a customer's full need spectrum it will play a role in making it a little bit more accessible in a quicker go to but i mean if i look on google today if i want advice on covid uh, if you guys actually google covid you'll find millions of pages if you look on google for pps you'll find millions of suppliers the practical reality is that the supplier who actually has to supply you on a day to day basis is one with a deeper relationship the same with a doctor so i think uh the healthcare system has had a great opportunity to build trust i hope that this covid uh virus continues to build trust rather than hurt trust we've already seen incidents where customers because of covid in their family have uh, gone a little bit too far with manhandling clinicians especially in smaller hospitals and i'm not sure that's an example of building trust i think that's an example the moment that happened the local governments uh, first reaction was there must have been something wrong from the hospitals and i don't think that's the right answer in many cases so i hope this opportunity builds trust in doctors and nurses and other healthcare providers because if we're not together we will not succeed in getting rid of this virus because uh, i the personal belief is this is not a one off virus attack this is one that will likely come back in different forms uh, over the next couple of years get uh, inputs sameer i think uh, trust will increase or decrease that's a open question still and digital uh, will remain as much recombinant or not that can also be debated uh, i have a uh, question which uh, taking off from what we knew spoke about in the uh, presentation in the, in the beginning he was uh, talking about uh, infection control in the hospitals and the ppe sterilization and reuse so we knew i will uh, request you to uh, uh, answer it like uh, later on uh, let's start with uh, other speakers uh, Nira ji, uh, your impression about the presentation made by Inu? Uh, yeah, see, uh, this this presentation is good. That's fine. But I think uh, what Sam was talking about, uh, you know, I'm more interested in that. You know, trust or no trust. So I was thinking, you know, until as doctor is not doing a physical examination, you cannot see see the patient. I give you example. We got two segment. One is pediatrics. One is mother. So our all obstetrics patient are not doing VC. They are they are coming to the hospitals. 
still you know physical examination is a key thing i think you cannot change healthcare with the digital in full way of course there is a time is bad so we are going for a vc our 40% 50% consultation is going down and still healthcare is a human touch i think patient has to come doctor has to do a physical examination so our 90% consultation of and gynec patients are coming to the hospital however 50% pediatrics are not coming to the hospital because of a season which has been discussed point noted uh, uh, dinesh uh, yeah. Sushin, uh, you want to respond on this uh, presentation by Vinu on uh, the sterilization issue and reuse of PPEs? Yeah, I think it's a very important uh, uh, presentation as well as a very important topic. Uh, we will definitely be running out of PPEs very quickly. We don't have enough of them. And uh, as I said, if, if this actually changes uh, the, the clinician's point of view completely that you start thinking of every patient coming in as a positive COVID and you apply universal precautions to every patient, then the uh, number of PPE kits required would be humongous. You can never uh, make sure that you get enough uh, from a, a sourcing point of view as well as from a finance point of view. You can't afford to buy so many. The government will not change its rates. The Ayushman Bharat rates will remain the same. The ESI rates will remain the same. You can't really work on changing any of those prices. So you do need to, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, recirculate them as uh, Vinu said, you need to reprocess them. And uh, I think we need to keep looking at possible solutions which are most cost effective and the easiest to avail of. So I think it's a very important initiative. Uh, we should all be looking at it from, from our perspectives. Thank you, Dr. Shushin. Dr. Alok, your perspective on this? Yeah, it was, a, it was a nice presentation and nice technology, but then uh, it's so expensive. <laughs> Which hospital is going to afford this? Uh, that's the that's key question. Yeah, plasma is very expensive. So the plasma adoption in India has always lagged because of cost. And we still continue to use ETO, though it is banned in most of the countries, because it's cheap. It's as simple as that. Yeah, you, you can't treat Ayushman Bharat and ESI and CGHS and, and have plasma sterilization also. Sam, your perspective? So we've already uh, been using plasma sterilization. Uh, I think what we're hearing a lot with PPs and it actually I have to say, Vinu, it was a, a good share. It would have been great if we got it about three weeks back. Uh, because I think most of us have been wondering and scratching our heads how much can we reuse and what can we reuse. Uh, the reality is, if I look at Meta hospitals, we've been buying new and our percentage of new versus reuse has been 100% in new's favor until the start of this week. And this week, we're probably going to move to 20% reuse as part of our uh, PPE mix. The challenge we're having is a lot of our clinicians don't have the confidence today to have reused PPEs. Uh, and if you're a top surgeon in a hospital, the practical reality is they're gonna to come to you and say, I want a new PPE or I'm not going to practice here tomorrow. That's I think the reality. Uh, and what are you gonna say about it? You're gonna kind of like nod your head and uh, the, the sad reality, I'll tell you what's happening in a lot of hospitals is uh, they're giving that same mask to the next person down the food chain and that isn't right. So we took a slightly different stance to it. We said, look, you're not going to know what's reused or not. Uh, we're going to give you a supply. If you want to use it, use it. But if you don't use it, we will remember this. Just the same way as most people have long memories, we also have long memories. Uh, and it's our interest to keep everybody safe. So the same mask I'm asking you to use, I'm going to use. It's not that I'm going to use a brand new mask and ask you to take a reuse mask. So I think, Having these protocols in place is vital. I think we need to figure out how to reuse, but if the cost of recycling and reuse is more than the cost of buying a new mask, it ain't feasible. And that's part of the problem with a lot of the plasma sterilizers. Are we getting masks recycled fast enough so that we can reuse them? Uh, if you just do the math, it, it's not always in the interest of what we're seeing. So therefore, uh, we are waiting for much bigger bundles. And that means that there is a risk of contamination 
with the size of the sample that you're going to use for recycling and deterioration. Uh, great inputs, Sam. Uh, we know uh, your response on these perspectives. Um, okay, uh, with, uh, with regards to reuse uh, plasma sterilization, uh, let me just set the tone right so that you know this is only for an emergency situation. This is not a permanent situation. Uh, the whole reprocessing, as they're calling it, sterilization, reuse, PP, reuse of N95. I am very, I am very sure that in the coming course of months, I am very sure that there would be new, new innovative technologies of PPEs itself. And the, the way the whole change is happening. Number one, that is definitely going to happen. Number two, as I was telling you about trust amongst the commons man, the second thing I'm going to tell you is that I'm very sure that the governments, that is state governments or central governments, would definitely have a different view on healthcare today. In the last three months, it is only healthcare and healthcare that is coming on the forefront. So I am very positive and optimistic that healthcare budgetary allocations are definitely going to rise. Which proportion, which amount, I'm not sure. That is setting the tone right. Now, with reprocessing, I am once again reiterating that this is only an emergency situation. PPEs, which are supposed to be used for a, as a single use, should be used only for a single use. It's only because at this present juncture that we are having such a short supply that this reprocessing format has come in place. Uh, I'm not going to, uh, I don't want to uh, state that E2 is bad or autoclave is insufficient. All technologies can work to make it happen. Let's be very honest about it. But there are limitations on technology. And um, what I wanted to see since uh, the, the, the USFDA and the CDC has put this up on the system and it's available on, on the net, it's flashing like uh, crazy. So that's what I said, this can actually help you in the reuse. And there is a protocol that has been set in. The challenge of the protocol always, as you can see, is the cleaning, which has not been mentioned in any of the systems because it affects the, uh, the, the way it's meant to be reprocessed. So I, I would like to tell everybody and who's watching also that this reprocessing of the PPEs and the reprocessing of the mask is only an emergency situation. And I'm sure, as, uh, to, to, to what Dr. Samir is saying, I'm very sure that in the course of a month, you're going to have a different kind of a PPE, which will be cost effective from different uh, solution providers. Thank you. Excellent, excellent inputs. Uh, let me request each of the panelists to look at the Q&A and uh, pick up one question which you uh, feel uh, uh, you would like to answer. So uh, I hope uh, some of you have seen the Q&A on your screen. Uh, Ralu, have you? Yeah. So we can start with you itself. And and I will request others to have a look. And uh, we can start responding to questions. There is, there is one of the question Mr. B.G. Menon is asking, unlike video consulting, do you see an increase in home calls? Yes, home calls are more now. You know, home calls are coming, so many home calls. But home calls are coming. Can you give us a pass so that we can come to the hospital to see? So we have tied up with one of the company, which is a cab company. So whenever a patient want to come for the hospital for a consultation, we used to issue them a certificate. And these cabs used to bring patients from their homes to the hospital and back to their homes. I just want to mention that. Okay, uh, you want to respond? Yeah, I have a, I have a question. Somebody has asked a very interesting. I thought this was this would have been part of the panel discussion. Uh, healthcare business has said, what kind of support do you expect from the government in coming months in terms of policy and viewers? Um, I thought that was a that was a that could have been a talking point in the in in the in the panel itself. Uh, now, this is a very interesting question. I mean, everybody is thinking that the government will come up with something. Now, uh, uh, 
before uh, looking at the government we should look at ourselves also as we discussed very rightly earlier that uh, sit on cash stay away from debt uh, try to capitalize as much as possible sell your shares cheaper so that you have more capital than debt uh, now however uh, what uh, we will definitely expect more deglobalization that will definitely going to happen as uh, we will uh, european countries have already made it mandatory for government approval for all acquisition because chinese uh, singaporeans are sitting on huge piles of cash that's where lots of these uh, predatory uh, uh, funds are going to come from so one thing is that uh, the government should make uh, mandatory approval for all international acquisitions as companies are available cheap and there is a fear that china may uh, look to take over companies in india post covid now uh, interest rates are going down further but banks must uh, pass it on to the company rbi lends only to the banks and the banks are concerned more about their own balance sheet than national interest so uh, this this must be sort of has to be there the banks have to low interest rate the way rbi is low um uh, we uh, don't expect the government to be able to print more money though in the us they will always be printing more money because their 10 year paper is 0.77% india is 6% india investment rate is triple b that's the lowest investment grade if we get it graded down we become a junk bond so that's why it will be difficult for the government to print money but definitely interest rate lowering uh, deferment of uh, payments uh, for tds short term deferments have already been done but uh, maybe as the situation evolves a uh, longer term deferment and uh, uh, and uh, protection from predatory takeovers so these are the basic three things that we would uh, expect from the government great okay i have got a question from mansi mishra so uh, i will answer that uh, she asks how does a 100 bed hospital protect itself from the crisis uh, she has some she has seen some hospitals giving 15 days leave to the staff and almost on the verge of shutting down so i can give you practical examples of what we are trying to do all our hospitals are about the same size uh, we are uh, 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 about 100 to 150 beds each in each of our 12 hospitals uh, first of all is try to get your fixed costs as low as possible so if you are on a rental model which we are uh please do talk to pick up the phone and talk to your landlords we have been talking to all our landlords uh, uh and trying to get rental waivers most of them have been very receptive and very cooperative uh we just feel that you know talking to them would be difficult but it is not so so please talk to your landlords second please talk to all your doctors and staff as i said earlier as well uh try and get a, a pay cut for all of them or at least deferred pay which is the most important hold on to your cash flows as much as possible so uh, tell them that uh, uh we will uh, cut your pay right now but uh, it's not really a pay cut uh, if if they can accept a pay cut that is very very good for you but even if they don't accept a pay cut tell them that this pay cut will be reimbursed to you when business gets back to normal another 3 to 6 months or or whenever you feel that the business uh, is coming back to a routine of what you were earlier third uh, do try to save costs in everything so electricity uh, uh, all utilities all materials uh, all pharmacies these are some things that are the leakiest of all as dr alok malik also said there's a lot of leaking going on in all these things so try and Uh, monitor each and every cost discuss with your unit head uh, or your managers exactly what cost percentage they aim to achieve write it down and monitor it on a daily basis that this is the cost that is coming down on a daily basis try to recycle uh, as much as possible reuse as much as possible without compromising on patient safety of course and uh, as uh, somebody also asked what is the government doing so again 
we should not just assume that the government will not help us so reach out to all your uh, cooperative bodies the local ima the hospital owners association and get a letter in place at least put your representations to the government we will ready done that the karnataka association has done that in a big way uh, right to the health minister the power minister uh, the finance minister of your state as well as the center the chief minister asking them for deferments in loan payments asking them for deferments in utility payments like electricity which is a big cost for hospitals and uh, just try and push the advocacy as much as possible you never know if even one of them agrees to you know something because the government doctors push this for the haryana uh, uh, health minister and the chief minister sitting in a press conference suddenly announced that we are doubling the salaries of everybody working in the government system who is fighting against covid so you never know these kinds of sob scam come around in your particular state so do keep working at them as much as possible but as i said plan out your cash flows very very diligently micromanage your cash flows right now it is absolutely a cold red so do not leave it to other people to work for you sit on them daily review them daily and make sure you have enough cash in the system for at least the next 3 months ideally the next 6 months okay samir uh, do you want to uh, answer some question yeah i'll take the most recent one private hospital sector is uh, is very big so how can they help the government hospitals by providing manpower or equipment this is by jugal guj uh, so i think different uh, hospitals have taken a different stance the reality is that i think 80% of ventilator beds i think it's actually higher than 80% sit in the private care setting uh, the uh, i think the reality is it depends by state where the government is because you take a place like tamil nadu today most private hospitals are seeing single digit covid cases i'm talking about the covid focused hospitals they're seeing single digit covid patients most of them are on one or two some of them are on four or five with a couple of suspects that are in single digit maximum maybe 10 12 if you look at the government hospitals most of the covid response centers are running really at around 20 to 30% occupancy meaning that there is still a 70% capacity for surge now obviously uh, when they're talking about what is occupancy this excludes ventilators because that data is very very opaque it's not transparent today we do not know how many of the private beds that are being occupied are ventilated beds versus non ventilated beds and so one of the things that i really think all governments can do first is probably provide these dashboards just like what we see on ndtv and many of the other uh, media companies uh, what is the number of cases in a state that's great information it gives us a wake up call it tells us perhaps that it's either growing or we should be a bit more confident because the numbers are coming down but the reality is it doesn't actually help drive any decisions most state government central officers who are in part of covid this is the data they're looking at how many ventilated beds are currently being occupied in their different response centers and what we are piecing together with some exceptions of some states most states are running at a very very low government capacity which means the government still has plenty of scope to expand uh if you take karnataka which is a great example i think uh dr devi and alex had worked really well through ahpi to offer the government along with uh, the infosys foundation to uh put up hospitals where they would provide the private sector would provide the staffing as well as ventilators and equipment i think that work and that sounded great because somebody like nh which is more a heart hospital was never going to be your primary covid response hospital but that being said i think if you were to look at for example a baptist hospital uh, which sees all types of patient they would see patients that were covid or non covid uh, or a manipal or an apollo uh, so i think it's horses for courses depending on who it is i think there are two things that really help and two things that really hurt so i'll tell you the things that hurt this uh when we hear discussions about privatize uh, sorry a government taking a private healthcare system public or taking over those systems without clarity on what the 
aspirations are on what the long term duration of these takeovers are it puts a lot of shivers into the private healthcare system and actually most of them freeze they don't come forward and offer their hospitals to partner with the government most of the hospitals in adjoining state the first reaction is oh my god if the government was to do this it's a nightmare but that being said i think there have been some very interesting moves by some of the governments in the southern states which have offered actually we'll play all the bills we'll cover rents and we'll cover uh, all the doctor staff salaries of private healthcare institutions that we are taking over to manage to do response so i think that's actually a good stance if they have a conversation with private healthcare players so that's one of my plus is that the more conversation the government has with open ended agendas with the private healthcare sector you will get better answers because clearly i think all of us are collective in this to get out of this uh, virus surge case so that we are all looking at a much brighter future than we are today whether it's government whether it's private to be honest most of us are all stressed about how do we get back to work how do we keep our staff safe how do we keep our customers safe and if you can't guarantee that because of uh, coordination with the government it doesn't truly help uh, i think the sector so uh, if you are telling me the private sector is very big i don't think it's big actually from a number of beds it's smaller than the government sector it's actually also smaller than two other sectors uh, which is typically the number two player in any uh, ecosystem after the government and state is the army and the third is the mission or trust hospitals so uh, if you look at those systems those are great systems to look at how do you work together with the government to make sure that you are prepared for emergency responses like this uh, and i think most of our doctors are currently helping government hospitals if we're honest about it with uh, surge and we've actually given off quite a lot of our doctors that had dual roles with the government and ourselves to spend much more time in the government system so that they can make sure that the customers are safe at a bigger level right because if you're managing 1000 beds in a government hospital and only 200 beds in a private sector impact is at 1000 beds not at 200 beds that's an example of simple things that you can do to promote and to stop the more you communicate i think it's better at a time like this well said sami well said uh may I request a uh, very to uh, look at the questions you know there are three questions one is the first question by uh, chandra uh, chandra shekhar on the data for uh, reuse yes there is data which has already been done and uh, that can be shared there's also a question by pramila can we reuse uh, the 3m mask and the covid in 19 uh, after doing P, uh, after doing eto uh, specifically 3m has uh, come out with a bulletin Uh, two days ago that please do not use uh, eto for their uh, n95 mask uh, that has been specifically written by the 3m and it's, since the question was specifically 3m mask so that has been written by them though 3m is a big uh, eto company but they have said not to use their n95 mask on an eto there's also one more question by uh, mr bg menon whether uh, asp has been able to talk to the government i can uh, talk for kerala because since i am based in kerala uh for kerala yes we have already talked with the government of kerala the government of kerala already has partnered with uh, some of the private hospitals here on reprocessing some of their stuff so that is already on the go thank you thank you and uh, neeraj you want to respond uh, to any question uh in one of the question i was seeing they were talking about what are the expansion plan of the hospital is there so what hospital should behave so uh, i have seen most of the hospital hold their expansion plan for a month or so because uh, so i think uh, in this time i think we should take care of our hospital which is primary running expansion plan should be on board there some caution somebody is asking excellent so i think uh, we are uh, close to the discussions uh, close at the uh, end of the panel i uh, thank all the team the uh, panelists for joining in here really uh, great discussions great inputs great ideas and a uh, lot of uh, new uh, uh, i think uh, suggestions have come in and i think uh, it would be uh, helpful for all the audience who have uh, been here on, on this 
webinar. So uh, thank you all the audience and uh, let me inform you all that this uh, video of this uh, panel is available on our eHealth uh, Facebook page, on our LinkedIn page and also on our YouTube uh, page. So you can like it and share it and let the ideas flow as much as possible so that everyone else uh, benefits who has not been able to attend it today. So with this, thank you to all the speakers again. Namaskar.